Being Human with Algorithms today with Tom Albrecht, Federal Manager of the Social Democratic Party, SPD in Germany. Tom, thank you for coming to the interview. Could you briefly present yourself to our audience? Well, it's a pleasure being here. And uh, I was a state secretary in the German Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs from 1914 to 1918. Um, uh, 2000. 14 to 2018, yes. and I, I worked a lot about issues around the future of work. We issued a dialogue with major stakeholders about how the future of work looks like in Germany and should look like, and what we do to make it a good future for good work in Germany in the future. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a very good background. And we are happy not to be in 1914 to 1918, actually. So the, the first question is, there's this buzzword digital transformation. So we have a change of society that goes along with more and more software and algorithms, technology dominating our private life and also our work life. And therefore, the first question is always, how do you personally perceive these effects of the digital transformation what is the most prominent thing when I tell you digital transformation what are you thinking of well I think it's changing all parts of our life it's changing our economy it's changing our workplaces it changes our private life in a way it changes also our societies and also our political systems so I think it's a fundamental transformation we're going through um, but it has a lot of positive effects and some risks we have to tackle mm -hmm. and w when when you think back now 10 years ago it's not so much but when you think back on your on your personal work, what would you say changed most? Um, I think we are much more interconnected. We are much more mobile and flexible. Mm -hmm. We can work in a lot of jobs, at least in my job too, mm -hmm. from nearly wherever we want and uh, whenever we want. And maybe that is the most profound change because we can communicate from everywhere with nearly everybody. And do you, do you have the impression that you're working more? I mean, you probably didn't work on the same job 10 years ago, obviously, but if you, if you talk with colleagues that had a similar position 10 years ago, like job-wise, I mean, it's obviously different what you do, but I, often we, people tell me, like, okay, it's something like always on. So you, you are theoretically and practically reachable 24-7. Do you switch your phone off uh, sometimes, or do you have multiple cell phones? I, I do have different cell phones and I have a routine with my team that yeah. if something is uh, not so urgent, they'll send me an email. Yeah. Um, if it's more urgent, they might send me a text message and it's, if it's really urgent, they call. So yeah. I can um, oh, see what's, what's happening yeah. and, and if I have to react now or maybe it's okay when I do it next day yeah. in the job. But yeah. of course, you're right, the blending between work and private life, um, that has increased a lot over the last years in my job too which can be a positive or a negative thing because I mean I'm a researcher and so as a researcher you have lots of freedom of what you're working on and when you're working on it at the same time when I have a paper deadline that is often on a Sunday night then I'm working the entire weekend obviously on that. Um, which would you say are the most positive effects of this digital transformation? I think um, getting away also from this mobile uh, work I issue Generally speaking, I'm quite optimistic that we can move to a much more humane world of work if we use uh, technology, Internet of Things, um, algorithms, machine learning, um, because a lot of the more, let's say, stupid, routine, repetitive tasks can be taken over by machines. So that, that's positive, and I think that's the most positive things because we can stick to what is really human, that is human communication between humans, it's um, everything about emotional intelligence and it's um, empathy I think cannot be automized, at least in the foreseeable future. So I think, um, yeah, working life could be more humane in the future mm -hmm. through technology. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very, very interesting point. When you tell this, immediately it comes to my mind that jobs are changing because as you say the technology is taking over parts of the jobs that we had before so like repetitive tasks on the con on the conveyor belt or something like that are maybe then automated by robots um, but this also requires the different skills from the workers and what what is your position there what what does have to change for instance in the educational system or lifelong learning are things I'm thinking of 
what what would you say are the things that that need also to transform which in my opinion are maybe a little bit behind at the moment and so what, what would you say are the most important things in that direction yeah i think your question hinted into the the right direction mm -hmm. because we really have to make sure that people and that means all people uh, are getting along with the changes and no one is left behind and inequalities between skilled workers and not so good skilled workers are not increasing but rather decreasing and for that we need of course a good uh, education system maybe a system that is more oriented at learning to learn rather than to learn knowledge mm -hmm. which you could get somewhere anyhow um, and then of course over the life course people will have to adjust and um, we know that certain jobs will um, um, will not be there in the future I'm not optimistic uh, when it comes to the overall effects I think it will be rather positive or neutral so we, there will be work in the future but it will be a different work so we really have to make sure that um, we have the possibilities for reskilling, for upskilling mm -hmm. for all uh, workers. And I think this is really a huge task, and you're right, we're probably lagging a bit behind. And it cannot be solved by um, pulling just one trigger. Mm. We need the companies to train um, their, their people working for them, and that will be the major share of the retraining and reskilling also in the future, I'm quite mm -hmm. convinced. But there we really have to make sure that everybody gets the training he or she needs. We can mm -hmm. see from statistics that um, people who have a higher education, higher skills already, they participate more uh, in uh, lifelong learning um, um, mm -hmm. trainings, um, whereas I would say it should be the other way around, or at least level that low-skilled workers also get retraining and upskilling. Mm -hmm. But the companies will not be able to do this alone, especially if jobs really in one sector disappear and uh, new jobs are created in other sectors. Mm -hmm. Then I think we also have a societal obligation and we have to think about whether it's really um, sufficient that, for example, an unemployment insurance mm -hmm. kicks in only if a person is already unemployed mm -hmm. or whether an unemployment insurance, if they know that certain jobs will disappear, at least in the shape they have today, um, kicks in earlier and, for example, finds uh, requalification to make sure people do not get unemployed at all. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's an, um, also an obligation of the individual to take care about the personal um, qualifications, take a look at it from time to time. Yeah. Th there's some counseling and help probably is needed, but it's an obligation, I think, also for workers themselves to look at it and try to um, find some measures how to reskill themselves over the life course. And mm -hmm. there, again, if people don't have the um, material possibilities, we should think about um, providing these uh, possibilities uh, for them. But it's a huge issue, mm -hmm. and it, uh, all the economy and society is uh, asked to um, contribute to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very good answer. So um, earlier today there was, uh, there was a a talk and uh, the, he's in a, the owner of the company and he said um, wh what happens often or what happened to him is he was um, doing something in a company and then he was improving processes and so he managed to do the same quantity of production in uh, 15 minutes less of time and what happened is that they just gave him a higher goal for what he had to produce and so he didn't gain anything and he said it was the last day when he innovated something at the company because when he was employed there because it was obviously a negative reward for what he did there and so what he wants to introduce in his company now is he says so they are producing software and he wants to tell the team in the, in the ne near future um, they should improve the software and every minute that they save with the improved software, they can go home earlier. And this, of course, hints into the direction technology is doing parts of what we did as job before. And there might be not enough work for all the people, while not enough is a, a, a strange word anyways. So so what, how do you think will this shift? So will we, will we go to less hours um, per week, work weeks, or uh, how can we adapt to these changes? I think um, we will go, and I think we also should go to shorter working uh, times uh, in the future if the possibilities are there through the productivity gains you just spoke about. Probably it's not this very um, fixed um, issue of having one week less per week. It's uh, maybe sometimes it's more about people taking a sabbatical yes. or reducing working time if they have family duties and then go back to a higher working time. I think it's a more flexible model, but shorter working times. And I think there's also some reason 
to do this because when it's true what we said before that a lot of routine jobs uh, or routine tasks yes. in a job uh, are oblivious are not no longer needed then this also means that the rest of the work is uh, more um, um, needs more concentration mm -hmm. and uh, Yes. R routine work can also be a relaxing part of the yes. job, and if this disappears, then we need some other mechanisms mm -hmm. uh, to make uh, work uh, acceptable and shorter working times, more breaks uh, mm -hmm. could, of course, um, help with that. And how? So also very good point because the, the speaker also mentioned that that is like as the jobs are then probably more demanding. It's also good when you have some more hours of of free time but he explicitly mentioned that he didn't, does not want to make the job harder for the people so that they go home three hours earlier but when they go home they have to sleep for three hours because <laughs> otherwise they will just be dead um but yeah also very very good point and how, how do you think can we bring the employers to that they accept now paying me the same money for not working 40 hours but uh, 25 hours or 30 hours per week so are there any concepts that you're discussing about um educating the employers in that direction making them the incentive like okay it's a good thing you should try that out you should do it even if you're not a big company but a small and medium-sized company this this is the right way to go there are some incentives some trainings in that direction i think we we need a dialogue amongst employers there um and um i think w workplaces are very different from each other already today and will be more differentiated in the future even um but um i mean um I see. I can see that a lot of um, employers are looking, for example, at uh, new startup firms, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of startups in Berlin, at least, where um, employers say, "Well, a four-day uh, uh, working week is enough because yes. the creativity is sometime over, and yes. if people come for another day into the office, they are not really yes. um, innovative. They are not creating new yes. things." So um, I think that um, there is already a discourse amongst employers that it might be helpful yeah. not uh, just to squeeze everything mm -hmm. out of an employee, yeah. but rather think when is the creativity yeah. at, uh, the best. Of course, with yeah. the cooperation schemes they have, um, the, the, the way they develop things with agile methods, etc., but also with the question how long working really is good for the people yeah. and when, how long they are yeah. creative. Yeah, that's, good, that's good to hear because it's, I'm, I'm always telling the people it's a very nice time to live right now because there are lots of changes and there are also profound changes, and, but at the same time also lots of positive changes and uh, yeah, it's, and and it's also interesting to be in IT as as professor in computer science there, and also helping the young talents to get into that direction. So yeah, I also also love it. So coming from the positive to the negative effects, what would you say is the most negative effect that you perceive of the digital transformation? Well, we already touched upon this because um, the, the the risk that people are um, falling behind, maybe losing their job, um, and not uh, being helped to move from one job that is maybe no longer needed in uh, in the future to another. Um, I think that's the, the greatest risk, and I think especially you can see in a lot of Anglo-Saxon uh, countries, mm. there's a lot of debate that middle. Um, qualified jobs, middle income jobs are disappearing and we still have low skilled mm -hmm. and low pay and high skilled and high pay jobs. I think for Germany with the special system of the apprenticeship um, um, training we have um, we have very adoptable um, workers in, in the middle skilled sector. I'm more afraid about um, low skilled sector where automation is really possible mm -hmm. and in the high wage country compared to other regions of the world like Germany probably more likely that these jobs are extinct. And of course we also have to see that um, wages are not falling behind in uh, all other sectors apart from IT. Yes. Um, and if I'm right that uh, the future of work has to do more with humans, mm. we really have to think about um, if the payment we do for care jobs, uh, maybe hospitals or childcare, whatever, um, if we do not have to adjust them because they're needed also to, due to demographic yes. changes. Um, and uh, very often are not really low skilled, but low mm. paid. And I think yes. we really have to think about if we do not value them better and also then pay better in the yeah. future. Uh, this is this is also a very interesting uh, point that I'm I'm always curious about how the the value of the work how does this happen so because I personally have the, have the impression that 
it's it's just a historic thing that certain jobs are paid a certain amount and it's not reflected in the value that they add to society today so i have a little bit this impression and so so how does this mechanism work so how do you how does how can this adoption work is it the state who is to say like okay a nurse should be paid this and that much right now or will the market itself somehow adopt what what how could this process be i mean we, we uh, in this area as markets alone will not fix the problem mm. and and you're right there are historical issues around it there's also a gender bias problem mm. around it because a lot of women do the job and earn less which was okay when women were just uh, um, in a family uh, traditionally some co-earner to to brought some extra money rather than being the breadwinning part it, nowadays it's very often that it's 50 50 between men and women being breadwinners um, so we have to overcome that for that reasons too and of course um, here we have a market which is very much public financed and then of course the state is the only customer mm -hmm. and in a way has a monopoly as a customer um, we have to decide politically that we want better pay uh, here in these areas mm -hmm. yeah but also they also have some uh, some interesting thoughts but they lead they lead too far now i guess about the um yeah, also about the about the payment structures of the state because they have. I just to briefly say something. I have the, I sometimes have the impression that ex especially the state is lacking very much behind in making this equality and also the payments that would be more or also like like contracts. Like when you think about this Kettenbefristung at the academic sector and stuff like that, and is is there a reason why the why the state on the one hand makes laws that are have a certain intention and at the same time it seems. It seems to willingly violate these laws to express it like that. Maybe because the state can. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And of course, the state also has to take a look at its budget and not spend uh, money yes. uh, on th things uh, that are not reasonable. Yes. Um, but the possibilities the state has. Um, at the other hand, um, makes it uh, more um, important that the state ta takes really responsibility, yes. really looks at things yes. out there. Yes. There are, and and of course, um, in the care economy, I think the the, the market is changing because yeah. we already can see a shortage of uh, skilled labor there. Yes. We see a lot of people working, especially in elderly care. Yeah. They don't work there until they are retired because yeah. they can't for, yeah. for health reasons or they don't want to because yes. working conditions are so bad. And I, we really have to think about if we yes. how we can improve this. Yes. Okay. Very good. So, so switching a little bit to another thing that I heard in the talk, namely there was was a a guy from the Gewerkschaft, and he said that you we would need algorithms where more people have to say something already in the specification. And his implementation was that you should make an assembly of all the people that are using a certain software, for instance, early in the development time, and then they should discuss all the issues, and um, only later the software should then be developed, so that you have a very strong influence by a broad uh, amount of workers and in the way the software and the and the technology is shaped that they're using afterwards do you consider this a good and a viable idea um, i think in general it's a good idea there might be practical limitations uh, to that how many people you really can involve in, in developing a software but especially if it's a software that is um, uh, works with with uh, data from for example workers of course it's possible to um, incorporate them from a very early stage though so you have the varieties of workers types and backgrounds uh, already in developing and, and then the self-learning of the uh, of the software so i think in general it's a good idea because you can um, try to um, prevent some biases and we know that uh, also algorithms have prejudices and yes. biases because um, it depends on the people who develop them and the, their background and what they think should be the right example or they can strengthen certain trends if uh, for example a typical fitting candidate if you are a human resource person looking for 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 someone to fill a job and you always had uh, men there and uh, with a typical career um, then an algorithm um, used there could yes. then uh, strengthen this because any person who had some breaks in the career because of family reasons feels does not fit uh, the, the the search uh, mm -hmm. routine so i think really with there are issues we have to take care yeah. about 
And th this is also a very good uh, bridge now because it brings us to the to the topic of machine learning or the buzzword artificial intelligence because this is exactly where then we do some data mining and then we do some automated reasoning and then we use it for decision processes. Um, uh, what, do you, what, what do you think about the, the artificial intelligence or more better machine learning research in Germany there? Like very strong efforts now, putting lots of money into this business. Also, it's a very good thing that the German-French connections are strengthened in that direction. Um, um, do, do you think we have a chance to to close the gap to the U.S. and China? And uh, do you have a do you have an idea like how this could happen? Do we have specialist areas where we should specialize in Europe, or do we have to change the law so that we can collect more data and have the same data pool, or that we are allowed to experiment more with technology? Any any thoughts in that direction? Some thoughts, um, but it's very hard, really, to tell if there's a chance for us yeah. to 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 catch up to to the US on the one side and China on the other yeah. side. Because uh, yes, uh, we are investing now a lot of money into it, and I think we still have good universities, etc., to draw upon. But the money that has already been invested uh, in the US and in China, of course, is a different one and they have the systems operating and collecting data now for, for a long, long yes. time. So I think we have to think two ways. Um, the, the one is what could be the, the speciality of the, of the German, mm -hmm. I prefer machine learning from... Yes, uh, it's also a much better term, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, are there certain things where we think could be better than what has already been de developed? And the question we just touched upon with the biases, the question of um, ethical implications of uh, machine learning, I think our debate might be a step ahead from uh, the other two uh, countries we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Same is too with um, uh, data security, data protection issues. Mm -hmm. There also we could have a, a, a competitive advantage uh, in Europe which we could develop. Yeah. And the other thing is that we really, because also the American, let's say, uh, machine learning is set up with, with data that is produced uh, inside Europe. I mean, if you mm. think at searching machines or social media platforms, mm. there are a lot of uses in, in Europe yes. providing data for free. Yes. Um, I think we should also think about whether if um, certain platforms really are, are getting a monopoly, we have to debate whether this data is really private for this company's yes. use only, or at least yes. the aggregated data could be yes. also made public for yes. um, companies uh, all over the world, but also including yeah. in Europe, um, and also public uh, administration, etc., to use this data, at least part of it, um, that it's uh, laid open because it's produced by all of us and not by some people in California yeah. only. Yeah, yeah, that's also a very good point. So having, having more open data. I think would would be a good thing because it would indeed destroy this monopoly. And there again, I would say that it would be good if the state would make a start and we would have more open data because now I'm living in France and so there you get much more information about the public transport, about energy networks and so on. And in, I'm also living in Munich or I was living in Munich and so there they are also making efforts, but it's just one city. And so this could also be something interesting that that we strengthen that. Or when I think about Spain, we had some projects with Spain, and so there it was. When we when we approached the community, the the the, um, the cities there, it was like, oh yeah, totally great. We want to cooperate with you in this project. When I approached people in Germany from cities, they were like, oh no, we never did that before. We we have no interest in that direction. Yeah, I think public administration in Germany has to open its mind uh, to this yeah. kind of projects. That's yeah. I t totally agree that we should move more into an open data yeah. um, approach here. Yeah, and uh, to, uh, switching to yet another topic, do we have a digital divide between older and younger people so that they have better access and usage of technology? And is this a problem? Um, I think the divides are not so much about age groups. There is there is a divide, but. Um, let me tell you one example from my current work. Um, the Social Democratic Party in Germany is at the moment uh, looking for a new leadership and it wants to involve its members to vote for the uh, most, um, the, the people they, they want to have as a leadership. And we gave people the opportunity to register for an online vote and if you don't, uh, you'll get a, a letter uh, mm -hmm. home and you could vote by ballot and, and a letter. 
Um, we thought also it will be the young people voting online. Mm -hmm. It's not true. The quota is the same mm -hmm. until in Germany or in, in our party then um, at about 70. Mm -hmm. If people are older than 70, you can see the mm -hmm. uh, share going down. Yeah. But we have a lot of um, older people, already retired people, who are uh, very interested in this kind of uh, technology because it helps them keeping in touch with children, grandchildren, and they have the time to experiment with this. And so I think it's not so much an age divide. We, we have problems still uh, with the question of broadband internet access uh, in the metropolitan mm. regions. It's much better than some rural mm. regions. Um, of course, it's a question of... Uh, um, of the family income to mm. to to be always on the uh, with the, ha have the newest devices which are expensive etc. So there are some divides, but I think the age divide is not really the crucial one, at least in Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as as I have you here, which is a perfect opportunity opportunity to ask that. So, as as someone very important in a in one of the big German parties, is there are also some uh, some changes through the digital transformation i'm now thinking into this direction with this rezo video about the the uh, cdu party um it, do you have to adapt when you when you want to get new members and which which are the changes that that you are undergoing there mm. yeah um, i think communication in general and also political communication is changing dramatically and uh and there's a whole range of things from things where we, where we have to adapt and also want to adapt and also get opportunities because you can directly contact people whereas in the past you could only via uh, media mm. um, but but of course you have to change the way you're communicating uh, up to the to the current uh, trends of communication and we can also see it diversification of communication in the past it was always the uh, eight o'clock evening news everybody was watching uh, and now it's some people are mm -hmm. uh, on looking on online web pages others use messenger uh, uh, services um, third still use television so it's it's more di diversified and you have to adjust to that mm -hmm. um, we also have to think about um, if we need some rules of the game and of course after the Cambridge Analytical scandal and now um, Twitter is uh, I just read today setting up new rules for mm -hmm. political communication in the US prior to the presidential election um, we really have to see what are the rules of the games and aren't there sometimes also some dangerous um, trends in the in the social networks especially because um, they get their revenue from the time you spend on a certain page. So um, sometimes this leads to have a most sensational headline mm -hmm. always brings people coming there and staying there. And this, of course, makes it difficult to uh, to communicate in a way to say, well, we have to look at this side and that, mm -hmm. that side and we need to make compromises. Um, you might be more um, <clears throat> uh, successful if you go to the extremes and uh, just put a message yeah. out very loud and right. up to the point that you, we can really measure that um, there's a different reaction to certain posts. Mm. If people um, post something positive, uh, then um, the other users would like it, mm. which has a rather small effect. Yes. Uh, the algorithms put it a bit higher, but yeah. not so, the, the reach is not so high. If um, people do something negative with anger, then it's shared. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if something is a sad news, then it's commented upon. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the posts with anger and aggressive ones, they are the ones most shared. Mm -hmm. That seems to be some psychological um, thing, yeah. how people deal with certain posts. Yeah. And we have to rethink if it's good, if yeah. you want to reach a lot of people yeah. to have aggressive, uh, yes sometimes violent posts yes. because they have the, the highest reach. We have to really yes. rethink uh, the systems there too and we have to discuss this also with the social platforms. Yes, yeah, it's a very, very, very good points. Also like thinking about uh, Donald Trump and his very offensive, offensive tweets. Um, is populism something that is fueled by the digital transformation? What would you say there? It's hard to tell. I mean, we had populism before in our history and in a lot of countries' histories. So um, 
I would be very careful to say the reason for, for populism is technological change. Mm. Um, but on the other hand side, it's quite obvious that um, the technology possibilities of today um, give a platform also to populists and yeah. one they can, can easily use. Yeah. So you see, I'm a bit yeah, hesitant yeah, yeah. to, to because be... Of, because what, I'm, what, what, I'm, what I was thinking of is exactly what we talked also about before a little bit, namely with the Cambridge Analytica thing, namely targeted addressing, to name it like that, or filter bubbles, another term for that, so that, or another th thing in the, which is the same, like if you are in, have thoughts into a certain direction, and, and before you were the only one in your city who has those, then you would not have developed them. But if you are now globally connected, then you can, can find for every topic, you can find a group on the internet. And so this is, of course, then somehow strengthening maybe the the movement or enabling even that the people are are or are getting together for, for these issues. Yes, and there's a responsibility and we have to think about rules. I know that no. uh, um, on Facebook, there you, you can um, show your ads, of course, to, to certain groups of people, and sometimes th these groups are defined by algorithms only. Yeah. And so it was at some point possible to uh, reach out to people who are against Jews. Yes. And only humans understood it and took away this possibility yes. to yes. target this special group. Yes. So I think it, that's a general issue we have to talk about when we talk about uh, algorithms, decisions, and machine learning. How far should it go? And what are crucial points where we still need a human reflection, maybe also a human decision yeah. at the end of the process? Yeah. Is machine learning aiding people with their work or uh, replacing yeah. uh, certain decisions? And I think yeah. we have a lot of sometimes very sad examples. If yes. you look at the Boeing 737 yes. MAX issue, where the crew, I think, theoretically, they could have, but they didn't know how to yes. overrule uh, the, the yeah. algorithmic Computer system, uh, system, yeah. system yeah. Um, that are issues we really have to look at. And I think there are certain decisions where we need a um, human in command approach um, at the end to recheck things and to, mm. to overrule um, decisions taken by, by computers. I fully agree. At the same time, of course, it's a matter of complexity. So you, it's difficult to find out the more complex the systems are, where these points are, and who are the people that have enough expertise for that. Yeah, but very, very interesting point. So, so coming closer to the end, so how, how are you, uh, how, what are the most important things where you would say you personally are shaping this digital transformation? Well, for me, as someone w working in the field of labor, um, it is a, a lot about um, this issue of t to take everybody uh, on board uh, on this journey. For example, now the German government started what I hinted upon uh, before, that uh, the unemployment insurance can already qualify people who are in danger to lose their job rather than being needing to be already unemployed. Um, that is some issue that is important. We also, in the world of work, we can see that we will have more people that are self-employed, um, not like an entrepreneur in a very mm. classical setting with uh, lots of employees, but uh, working on its own. Mm. Um, and we have to make sure on the one hand side that we ask, is it really an entrepreneur mm. if he rides with a bicycle from a restaurant to a home? Yes. Or shouldn't he be an employee? In Germany, we have two big companies, and one is organizing it through employees, others with self-employed. So I think yeah. we have to check this out, what is really happening yeah. there. But of course, there are a lot of really self-employed, which is good, and entrepreneurship innovation yeah. is good. But then we have some questions. And in Germany, for example, we don't have any um, system which um, self-employed have to pay into to for their pensions yes. uh, scheme. And we can yes. see that a lot of low earning self-employed end up then in a tax finance yes. um, basic pension, which is not yes. good for them, but it's also not good for society yes. because they ne never paid into the system. So now the government yes. has in its coalition treaty an obligation for self-employed if they don't have another scheme for a pension to pay into the um, 
legal system that which all employees pay into it. Yeah. And so changing the welfare state is also an issue if in a changing world of work. That yeah. are some examples. Yeah, this is, this is again like yet another topic where we could talk one hour about it. Sure. <laughs> so the, the last question then, what, what does it mean to you personally to live in a, in a world with algorithms? What does it mean being human with algorithms today? I think it's a very interesting uh, time, and I'm and uh, as I said, we 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 are moving in a direction which I think, generally speaking, could be have very positive effects. But we couldn't lean back and leave it all to technology or to some uh, large corporations. We really have to actively shape, and we have to also um, set some um, borders and um, rules and regulations there. Yeah. I mean, in some fields it's quite obvious, but still it's a political task to achieve it, for example. I don't want to live in a world where we have automated weapons that decide yeah. themselves whether to kill a person yeah. or not. Yeah. And we need some regulations and rules there and try to implement them. Yeah. So a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of um, responsibility for politicians, for humans, to make sure that um, the humane approach stays there in the future and sets some limitations all to, to yeah. algorithms. Again, like very, so about war systems, this is also something we could talk for hours. Sure. Yeah, so Torben, thank you very much for the, for the many interesting points. So to the viewers, as usual, if you have questions, if you want to discuss something, please put it into the comments. I'm also sometimes in Berlin and maybe we could also do a follow up sometime in the future. I know you're very difficult to reach, but it was a great pleasure talking to you and it was very interesting points. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.